So you're here to learn about new technologies, and among the technologies that you're going to hear about today and tomorrow are stereoscopic 3D, electronic content delivery, higher than 24 frame rate, higher spatial resolution, immersive sound, and laser projection, all the new future cinema. And there's a picture of a future cinema uh, designed by a German architectural firm in 2010. Uh, but are these really new technologies? Stereoscopic 3D, all of these dates, are, by the way, are for when they were used in motion pictures. So stereoscopic 3D for motion pictures, patented in 1852, used in theaters by 1915. Electronic content delivery proposed in 1877, used by 1927. Uh, higher frame rate, first proposed in 1888 and used around that time. Higher spatial resolution used no later than 1900. Immersive sound by 1932. And laser projection, is this something new? 1972. Now the picture I'm showing is actually an active shutter stereoscopic 3D viewing device used in theaters in 1922. But uh, lasers in 1972, yep. Theodore Maiman, the guy who invented the first laser, demonstrated it in 1960. In 1972, he founded a company called Laser Video. And perhaps the technology was not quite ready. It's not up to what you're going to see uh, at this show. But there were no artistic issues. There are pictures of his devices in 1974, including a picture shot off screen. We have other advances, giant screens, widescreen, uh, sound, color, stereoscopic 3D, high dynamic range, high frame rate. Uh, but the question is, do they add to or det detract from the storytelling? And I have a poster of The Hobbit here because uh, people have raised that issue about the high frame rate in The Hobbit. But I'd like to expand the question a little bit. When do we decide that? Let's look at high frame rate. Thomas Edison proposed a frame rate of 46 frames per second uh, in 1888. And although there's no exact record at the moment that he used 46, he certainly used frame rates in the vicinity of 40. But at the time, there was still this question, was that a good thing or was that a bad thing? Here's something that appeared in Electricity Magazine in 1891, and they were comparing it to Wordsworth Donisthorpe's um, system of motion pictures, which used eight frames per second. And they're saying, well, you know, considering the retina can retain an impression for seventh of a second, eight photographs per second are sufficient for the purpose of reproduction, and the remaining 38 are mere waste. So we shouldn't go up to 48, we should go down to 8. Um, so Edison proposed 46 per second, maybe used it, maybe didn't. Uh, silent shooting was typically about 16 per second, and the reason for that was they needed the exposure. Silent projection was typically about 21 to 27 per second. Um, the reason that it was faster than the shooting was uh, because they wanted to reduce the flicker. And in the smaller theaters, they used higher frame rates because they wanted to have more shows, get more audiences in. When Vitascope came, that's when the 24 frame per second standard started. That was 1925. The guy who chose 24 frames per second is shown at the right there, Stanley Watkins of Western Electric. It was not based on sound quality because the Vitascope system was a double system. There was a phonograph record for the sound and the pictures were run separately. By the way, the phonograph record introduced the rate of 33 and a third RPM. Uh, so where did he come up with the number? He spoke to Warner Brothers chief projectionist, said, how fast do people um, project movies? And that's where the 21 to 27 came from. He decided to weight it in favor of the larger cinemas, and he said, okay, we'll choose 24. Uh, actually, he chose 90 feet per minute, which turned out to be 24. Then ShowScan came out, which was a foray to 60 frames per second for film. Um, but is that good or is that bad? Here's an interview that appeared in American Cinematographer magazine in August 1994, and here's a director, and he says, after that film, Leonardo's Dream, which was shot in ShowScan at 60 frames a second in 1989, was completed. I drew a very distinct conclusion that the ShowScan process is too vivid and lifelike for a traditional fiction film. It becomes invasive. I decided that for conventional movies, it's best to stay with 24 frames per second. So which director came up with this? 
It was Doug Trumbull, who you've heard here at the cinema, pushing for higher frame rates. Um, no fault of his. People are allowed to change their minds and people are allowed to have their perceptions um, grow and learn more things with their perceptions. You'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, by the way, the Super Bowl this year used 4K cameras that can shoot up to 900 frames per second. Uh, you'll see an awful lot of 4K stuff on the show floor. Um, but high frame rate display is not yet trivial. So the fact that they were using a high frame rate camera doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be displayed like that. But rates as high as 300 frames per second have been proposed for display, for watching the pictures. Now here's an intertitle. This was fairly common in uh, silent movies. It advanced the plot. Any idea which movie had this intertitle? It was a pretty famous movie. Any ideas out there? Came out in 1927, does that help? The Jazz Singer. People think of it as the first all singing, all talking movie. In fact, large portions of it were silent and had intertitles. So that's 1927, but here are some other posters. There's a poster from 1905 for the Cinemato Grammo Teatro, um, which was a sync sound movie system. And then there's a poster on the right from the 1900 World's Fair in Paris for the Phono Cinema Teatre, uh, another system where you could go to watch sync sound movies. By the way, at that Paris World's Fair of 1900, we have the introduction of many advanced cinema technologies. We have the infinite aspect ratio in the uh, Cineorama, which was a circle surround um, system. It was shot perfectly. The projection was a bit of a problem. The projectors got too hot and it was declared a fire hazard. Uh, there was motion platform, so uh, tactile sensation in the Mario Rama. You took a ride on a ship and the ship tilted back and forth. There was angular velocity 3D at the Trans-Siberian Express. You could take a ride on a train and different bands would move past you at different speeds depending on how close they were. So the stuff that was very close to the train was moving at about uh, 300 meters per minute. And then uh, belts farther out would move at slower speeds. And there was not merely the Phono Cinema Teatro, but there were three different sync sound theaters where you could go to watch sync sound movies. Um, but ne none of them had the first sync sound movie. This might be the first sync sound movie. Okay, that was synchronized by Walter Murch. Um, people knew about the movie previously, then the cylinder was found that had the sound on it. By the way, that particular movie, based on uh, the synchronization of the sound, appears to have been shot at 37 and a half frames per second. So that's called the Dixon Experimental Sound Movie. Um, William Dixon was the person who shot it. He's also the person who was playing the violin. It was shot in Edison's uh, Black Mariah studio. But if sync sound was available since 1895, why didn't it take before the jazz singer? Was it that the technology was not sufficiently advanced? Was it that the quality was poor? Well, uh, the answer about quality might be a little bit different from the one we expect today. Here are things that Thomas Edison did when he went from cylinders to discs to get people to adopt his system. He ran what he called tone tests. And he would either blindfold people in small groups and have them see if they could tell the difference between uh, effectively a 78 RPM uh, record or a live singer or in a large hall. He would have them on stage, turn off the lights, turn them back on. And here's his advertisement and no one could tell the difference. And today we go, this is nuts. How could you possibly not tell the difference between a live singer and um, a scratchy mechanical record? Well, here's an article in the Pittsburgh Post, and the reporter says, I thought that I could certainly tell the difference, but I was amazed when the lights came back on that I saw it was only the phonograph there and not the singer. 
Um, but there was one slight thing I should mention here. One of the singers that Edison used was this woman, Anna Case, on the right. She was a soprano with the Metropolitan Opera, and she confessed in 1972 that she trained herself to sound like a phonograph recording. <laughs> but a little bit more about live sound versus canned sound. Now, we say, well, people certainly would have wanted to have sound movies rather than silent movies. But silent movies were accompanied by live sound. So what's better, having canned sound or having live performers there? Uh, here are three different technologies, I'll expand these in a moment, that were used for having um, sound in silent movies. Here's the one from 1918 for Das Kaviar Mauschen. See this sort of rhomboid on the column in the set? Um, those were cue lights that would go on and off to indicate to the singers or the musicians when they should start playing. Here's another version from uh, Van Manner Strijken, uh, 1919. Look all the way down between the uh, laughing guy on the left and the woman in the white dress, and you see a little bit of a semicircle. That's an image of a conductor. So the singers and the musicians could look at the screen and see the conductor and take their cues. And finally, here's one for uh, La Mujer de Medianoche in 1925, and this is the most complicated system. Down at the bottom of the screen, those of you in the front can see there's a musical score, and it would move along the screen, and there was an arrow to show where you are in the musical score, and those of you who are musicians might notice that it's backwards, and that's because the singers would stand behind the screen, and they could see the stuff and perform. So. With all of this technology, with the ability to cue all these people for um, live music in silent movies, nevertheless, today, movies have sound. So times have changed, perceptions have changed, people have decided that sound movies are the way to go. Here's a bit more from the Paris 1900 fair. Um, the Lumiere brothers came up with a giant screen. Initially, it was 24 by 30 meters. Then when the pavilion that it was going to be in shrunk, they made the screen a little bit smaller. And they decided that they had to shoot high-resolution frames for that. So they shot frames that were 60 millimeters wide. Uh, those two little tiny dots you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, those are people standing there. So it gives you an idea of the size of the screen. So if this was available in 1900, what do we get from IMAX that wasn't available then? Well, we get chairs. <laughs> there are also conflicting opinions on um, aspect ratio. Here's uh, something from an Exhibitor's Weekly in 1913, the Kinematograph and Lantern Weekly, and it says, you, the exhibitor, should crop the top and bottom of the movies to get to a wider shape because the result is a better shaped picture, more artistic, the portion masked off will never be missed. But then we have the great director, Sergei Eisenstein, and he proposed something called the dynamic square, which would allow you to go either wide or high, depending on what a particular shot called for. And he says, it is my desire to intone the hymn of the male, the strong, the virile, active, vertical composition. <laughs> That's not just aspect ratio. How about color? Uh, the first color motion picture patents came out in the 1800s. Uh, Kinema Color was doing commercial releases in color starting in 1908. You see one of them at the upper right there, the uh, Delhi Durbar in 1912. Uh, the supposed first color movie is Becky Sharp down at the bottom, 1935. But again, we have some directors saying, well, this is not necessarily a good thing. So Jean Renoir uh, says in 1974, since cinema is black and white, why photograph the other colors? And then we have Francois Truffaut saying, uh, I think that color has done as much damage to cinema as television. Uh, by the way, both of them shot in color. <laughs> and how about high dynamic range? Here's something uh, very, very recent. This is from the Hollywood Post Alliance uh, tech retreat, which was just this past February. Uh, Dolby did a presentation on their viewer preference testing for how uh, bright or how great the dynamic range should be between the highest speculars and the uh, darkest blacks. And they found that um, certain viewers preferred as much as 20,000 uh, nits of brightness. But at the same event, 
uh, Real D did a demonstration where they showed a scene from a 1969 movie and they showed it at peak whites of 48, which is from the SMPTE standard, 72 and 96 candelas per meter squared, and the seeming audience preference, not everybody in the audience, was 72. Well, there's a gigantic difference between 20,000 and 72. Now, not necessarily the same kind of thing, because Dolby's talking about speculars, not what we would normally talk about peak white. But again, people have different tastes. What else? These three posters that I'm showing here are from a 1959, three uh, 1959 movies, The Tingler, Scent of Mystery, and um, Behind the Great Wall. Uh, in The Tingler, we have this little tiny thing saying that it's being shown in Percepto. Uh, Percepto meant that in the theater there were some seats that had buzzers in them, and so at exciting moments you would feel a tingling on your spine. Uh, Scent of Mystery was shot in Smellorama, uh, sorry, Smellovision, and uh, Behind the Great Wall was shot in Aromarama. And then we have uh, Archibald Montgomery Lowe saying in 1926, there may come a time when we shall have smelly vision and tasty vision. When we're able to broadcast so that all the senses are catered for, we shall live in a world which no one has yet dreamt about. That's probably accurate. Um, he, by the way, has a very good record of predictions. He predicted alternative content for cinema. He predicted television and a bunch of other stuff. So what do we do? Do we fix old movies? Do we add sound to silence, synthesize stereo, upmix to surround? Do we colorize? By the way, colorization is not a new technology either. Here's 1902 hand-colored frame from uh, Melies's uh, Voyage to the Moon. Do we crop for different aspect ratio? Do we up-convert um, 2D to 3D? Do we up-res to higher detail? Do we up-frame 24 to uh, higher frame rates? Or do we go in the opposite direction and fix the new? Go back to black and white, as some directors like to do. Go back to silent. Uh, in post-production, add grain, noise, dirt, scratches, introduce jitter and judder. You say, this is nuts, except that last year, the 2012 Academy Awards, the best picture was the artist, best director also, which was an effectively silent black and white movie. Things take time. Um, you have to wait until you get to the sufficient technology level. You have to wait until there's an economic benefit that's perceived. And when you are doing a perceptual enhancement, as many of the things you'll be hearing about here, there is this issue that perception is learned. So if some people are saying, oh, they don't like the way The Hobbit looks today, maybe 25 years from now, people will say, well, The Hobbit looks fine. What about all those other movies that came out that year? Uh, opinions vary, and they do change. I'm just showing here a picture from 1952. Opera as alternative content was first suggested in 1877, first implemented in 1952, and broke into the top 10 in U.S. weekend theatrical box office gross in 2010, and it is now regularly in the U.S. top 10 weekend theatrical box office gross. So who knows?